God, we just thank you this morning. We have breath in our lungs, God. We are alive and well, and we just thank you for the gift of life that you've given us, God. May we spend our lives just praising you and thanking you, talking to you, God. We just ask that you come and fill this place this morning. God, come and fill the room, fill our hearts, fill our minds, God. We give you complete control to be the king of this service. We just love you, God. Amen.
to glorify, glorify the name of all names that nothing can stand against.
So I throw up my hands and praise you again and again. So that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king except for a heart singing. Invite the prayer team to go kind of post up in the back two corners of the room if you want somebody to pray alongside um, you we would love to create space to do that and if you just want to come up to the altar maybe lay something down maybe just connect with the Lord a little bit sometimes moving your posture and changing where you normally sit in the room um, just kind of gets you ready gets you postured to hear from the Lord and just connect with him so
that you've even gone to win my home. You come back with the head of my enemy. You come back and you call it my victory.
need to do is worship. Lord, I will just bow down. And I'm just going to stay
Good morning, church. Good morning. Hey, can we just give God another shout and a clap this morning for just being so, so, so faithful? I think sometimes we're so used to like, hey, we did it, good job, to where it kind of took a moment. Did you see the numbers on the screen? Uh, do you understand how long that took? Two and a half months. Two and a half months God, God provided. And listen, I just want to say uh, thank you. That was all of us. Uh, whether, whether you were able to write a big check or not, there was a lot of prayer. There was a lot that went into that. Um, and uh, you, can, you contributed to that. Um, and that was amazing. And so we are going to replace the 20-year roof with a 50-year roof. <laughs> um, and so, uh, so, I don't know, um, Pastor whoever, Samuel, uh, will still be here. Um, <laughs> 50 years from now, you'll have to replace the roof, buddy, um, or, or somebody. Uh, Talia, when Talia's leading worship here, she'll have to worry about the roof uh, 50, years, 50 years from now, uh, when she's a grandma. Maybe not. Maybe not. Let's not rush it. Let's not rush it. Hey, open your Bibles to Psalm 95. Well, we are uh, wrapping up our series called Life Here. Uh, we've been uh, taking a few weeks to talk about the core values of mountain life. And our core values really are the non-negotiables um, based on scripture, of course, based on God's call and design for us as a local church. Um, but these are the non-negotiables that make us who we are as a church family. And we've, we've talked about uh, our core values really come out of our mission and vision statement uh, but we have three sets of values. Our, our first set of values are how we approach God, our foundational values. Uh, our culture of values is how we approach each other. And then our functional values, and that's how we approach ministry. And so we've covered a little bit, and today we're going we're gonna to wrap this up. Uh, but our, our found, talking more about our foundational values, of course, uh, the Word of God, living by the authority of the Word of God. How many of you believe that the Word of God is true? Okay, if you don't, you're going to be offended with everything I say today. <laughs> um, we believe that the Word of God is the plumb line, is the final authority on all matters. Yeah. On all matters, period. But pastor, Facebook isn't in the Bible. Yes, it is. It talks about hell in Scripture. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. 
sorry, sorry, sorry. That was not the Holy Spirit, which is one of the, one of the core values uh, that we're going to be talking about. But we do believe that the Word of God is the final authority. Uh, prayer, we set a foundation in prayer in everything that we do. Uh, we are a prophetic church, not pathetic church. Prophetic meaning we do what we do based on the leading of the Lord. Jesus said, I only do what I see the Father doing. I only say what I hear what the Father has told me to say. And that's how we believe that we should be led as a church. And then we are a presence church, which means we seek the presence of God. God is omnipresent, but we seek the manifest presence of God in all of our meetings, everywhere, everywhere that we go and all that we do. Uh, and then worship. We honor God with our whole lives, with and without music. And that's what we want to talk about today. Uh, Romans 12, just really quick, verse 1 says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. So for the New Testament believer, according to Scripture, we, we worship God with our whole bodies. We, we offer our whole lives uh, as a living sacrifice, which means in the Old Testament, you would bring an animal and slaughter it and put it on the altar. For the New Testament believer, Jesus paid the final price. It was his blood that was shed once and for all for atonement. But we now place our lives on the altar in response to his sacrifice for us. Offering your body, offering your life up as a living sacrifice means we should be waking up with worship, going to bed with worship, and worship is everything in between. Now, does that mean that I have music playing all day long? It doesn't hurt. <laughs> but living a life of worship is so much more than music, and we are going to uh, talk about that today. Uh, <clears throat> but, but living a life of worship means everything that we do. The very breath in our lungs, the time that we spend, the way we, do our, the way we interact with each other, the way we have relationship, the way we do our jobs, even the way we drive our car on Highway 55. <laughs> Everything in our lives is to be worship for God. And some people are getting convicted. I should have I skipped today. Um, yes, so we live with our lives on the altar, which is worshiping without music. But for today, we're going to really hone in on worshiping with music as a core value. Um, so Psalm 95 says, O come, let us sing joyfully to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with a song of thanksgiving. Let us shout joyfully to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods, in whose hand are the depths of the earth. The peaks, are the, the peaks of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. Um, and his hands formed the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker in reverent praise and prayer. So here we see instructions on how we are to worship physically. We see singing, shouting, being thankful, being joyful, bowing down, and kneeling as appropriate postures of worship. The biblical definition of worship, Old Testament and New Testament, literally means to bow down and, and worship. And there's places where you see the word worship that's translated, of course, in Hebrew or Greek, translated into English, where it just says worship. Uh, but it would be in an instance where they would see God or, or God would reveal himself, the angel of the Lord would show up, or Jesus would reveal himself, and they would bow down, it said, and they worshiped him in English, which, which would literally mean to bow down in reverence. The New Testament, the word means also to kiss the hand, to fall upon your knees and bow, to kneel or to prostrate in homage. Webster's defines it as to honor or show reverence for as a divine being or supernatural power, to regard with great or extravagant respect, honor, or devotion. In Matthew 14, Jesus walks on water. Uh, he gets in the boat. And it says that, that the disciples worshipped him, and they said, you truly are the Son of God, and they, and they praised. Well, what happened was Jesus walked on water, and at first they were like, it's a ghost. And then they realized it was Jesus, and they were in awe. And then he gets in the boat, and they're astounded, and they fall on their faces, 
and they say, you really are the son of God. See, in this, in this case, it says, and they worshiped him, which English doesn't really do a great job. This worship is a response to a revelation of who he is. Mm. See, we worship as a natural response to the revelation of who he is and what he's done for us. We see throughout Old and New Testament, when people would come into the presence of the Lord, it was not like, hey, what do you want to do now? Oh, I don't know. Let's sing a song. <laughs> they, would, they would catch a glimpse of God, and they would fall on their faces. Old and New Testament, they would fall on their fla- faces like dead men. They would fall on their faces like, and, and say things like, I am not worthy. Ezekiel sees he sees the, the throne room of God and he falls on his face and he says, I am a man of unclean lips. And this is a response to seeing God. And throughout scripture, uh, when, when we see the words worship show up or we see a description of worship, it is always in response to God revealing himself, God doing something. Psalm 100 says, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him. Bless his name for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting and his truth endures to all generations. See, it is a response, and even in, in these psalms, they, they talk about how great God is, and then they say words of praise to God. They talk about what he has done, who he is, how he has blessed our lives, and, and this really is the, the heart of worship. And worship is not only a response to the revelation, but it's a response in our devotion to exalting God. What does exalting God mean? Well, that's a Christianese term for making him bigger than us, making him bigger than everything else. See, worship is more than just having to do with my feelings or having to do with how I feel. Worship has to do with what he deserves. He deserves to be the superstar in the room. He is the hero in the story. Human nature is that we all make ourselves the hero of the story. When you're saved, Jesus is the hero of the story. We are the benefactors of him. When you know God, you, you suddenly realize that you are not the hero in the story. He's the hero, and you are the recipient of his heroness, of his awesomeness. And that is, the heart, that is the heart that true worship comes out of. And it's not for our entertainment. Say that again. It is not for our entertainment. It is not for our entertainment or just to be blessed. Now, let me just say, I love worship. I also love music. It blesses me, but that is not the purpose of it. Yeah. And if you understand the true context of worship, now suddenly arguments over, well, it's a hymn. Oh, it's contemporary. Oh, I like this one. I don't like this one. It's up-tempo. It's not up-tempo. All of that just becomes a bunch of distraction. And can I just say hogwash? Because all of those things make it about me. All of those things make it about us when worship is not about us. And by the way, um, what hymns did Jesus sing? <laughs> songs, yes, you were right. But what about the new songs that he sang? And that's a whole other discussion that we'll have in a little bit. But see, he blesses us, but only as a byproduct of worship because it's, it's impossible to be in his presence without being blessed. But that is not why we worship. Psalm 24, 3 says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully. Yeah, so the way that we approach God matters. Um, We're careful to have the fear and reverence of the Lord and honor his presence. But there's a specific way that we should be approaching God. Psalm 24 is a kind of reference for that. And also Acts chapter 5, we understand that the presence of a holy God is not to be approached carelessly. 
There's a reason that they tied a rope around the high priest's ankle when he went into the Holy of Holies. Somebody figured out that they needed a rope in case that guy wasn't approaching the Lord the right way. But the Bible also tells us to be thankful. And I found, I found this interesting. Um, you cannot be thankful and grateful and also be anxious and worried at the same time. And that's a biblical truth that we've already built our lives around. Um, right here it says, Be anxious for nothing but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians um, 6 through 7. So, the word tells us not to worry, but instead be thankful. But science has also found out recently that anxiety and gratitude both function in the same part of the brain. So you can't really use both at the same time. Don't you love when science, like, backs up the Bible? Like, we've been living life that way anyway, but then some researchers came and said, oh, by the way, you can't be thankful and anxious at the same time. And we're like, we already knew that, but thank you for doing your study and confirming. <laughs> um, that's great. So Psalm 24, um, who may climb the mountain of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? Only those whose hands, are, hands and hearts are pure, who do not worship idols and never tell lies. They will receive the Lord's blessing and have a right relationship with God their Savior. Such people may seek you and worship in your presence, O God of Jacob. So we enter into his presence with thanksgiving, gratitude, and praise. But there's also a part in that scripture that mentions having right relationships, having pure hearts and pure hands. And those people may seek and worship in his presence. There's a few things that the Lord is drawn to or things that he responds to, if I can use that terminology. And I want to be careful not saying you do this, this, and that, and then the Holy Spirit comes because his presence isn't like a recipe or a formula. But he does respond to certain postures of the heart differently than others. So there is thanksgiving and gratitude, but there's also repentance. The Bible says to come as you are, but nowhere does it say that you should remain the way that you came. Come on. So Joe's going to talk about the tabernacle here in a minute, and there's a part of the process of entering into the tabernacle where the Jews would look at a reflection of themselves and see like a dirt on their face or like hair out of place. And it would give them an opportunity to make themselves right before presenting themselves in the presence of the Lord. This also happens during worship. There are moments during worship when God will bring something to your mind that you need to either repent for, maybe make a relationship right that hasn't been right between you and a fellow brother or sister, um, maybe a hidden sin that you've been letting go for too long. The closer you get to the presence of a holy God, the more aware you become of your unholiness and your flesh. So Matthew chapter 19, verse 24 says, I'll say it again, it is much easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. This verse is talking about the stuff that the camels would pack. They get loaded up with a bunch of stuff traveling from here to there, and the eye of the needle is actually talking about a narrow way that the camel has to go through. So, they would have to take all the baggage off, all of the luggage, all of the stuff, before the camel could pass through this narrow way. This is also like us during worship. The closer you get to the presence of the Lord, the less you can take with you. Come on. That's good. Your anger, your resentments, your opinions, even your anxiety, depression, or fear, your pride. Let the Holy Spirit fill in the blank of what it is that you're trying to take with you into the presence of the Lord. The Asbury Revival was kindled and sparked by a message of repentance. It was a call to repentance. It was a sermon on repenting that started a weeks-long revival on that college campus. The Lord answers the call of those who have a repentant heart. And I really wish there were more songs about repentance. We have a ton of songs about um, battles being fought, victory, um, a bunch of like faith and hope and love. We all love to sing about how loving God is, but we don't have enough songs about repenting to the Lord. So maybe we should write, a, maybe we should write some. <laughs> so I want to I want to take a moment to talk about the tabernacle and um, and if you are brand new to this, you don't understand even what tabernacle means. Um, it's the house where God dwelled and. 
Uh, and God, of course, doesn't need man to do anything for him, but God chose uh, in the Old Testament as a model for man to build, first of all, the, the, the tent of meeting or the place of worship for him. Uh, and then later on, King Solomon was able to build a temple, um, all of which are just uh, foreshadows of what God's intention was, and that's for you and I to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so when we, when we look at the, the tabernacle in the Old Testament, the way that we should be viewing the tabernacle is really as a it is really with some introspection of what that means for how we approach God and how our hearts are. Now, this is, this is not a, um, a bless me, get a jet airplane kind of a sermon um, or a prosperity sermon. The, this, this really is talking about how we should approach God. Um, go ahead and put the tabernacle image up there. Um, so, so this is what uh, the tabernacle of Moses looked like. And you can, you can see that there's a, a tent on the left and the pillar of smoke. Uh, well, that's during the, the smoke by day and the, and the pillar of fire by night. That was where the manifest presence of God was in the tent. And when you entered into this place, nobody got in by the back door, by the way. No one got to climb over the, climb over the, the gate. In fact, if you tried to get in the wrong way, you'd be killed. And if the presence of God didn't smite you, the people of God would take you out. You would, you would get stoned, not, not the other kind of stone, but you would get hit with a rock. And that was not the Holy Spirit either. And so, so the, the, entra- the entrance curtain was how you entered. So when we read this psalm and it says, you enter into his courts with thanksgiving and into his gates with praise. This is, this is coming from the example or the model of the tabernacle. When you would first walk in, you didn't get right into the presence of God. When you first came in, there, there was a, a place, you see the brazen altar. The brazen altar was a place where sacrifices were made. This is where worship happened. This is where they would give their thank offerings. They would give their wave offerings, their heave offerings, and the list goes on and on and on. Maybe someday we'll do a full series on the tabernacle. Um, but they would, they would get to a place, and you could see the slaughter tables around the outside. So worship was not pretty, by the way. Um, we, we like pretty worship. Worship was not pretty. In fact, if you didn't have a strong stomach, worship would have been tough for you. Um, and so the, the animals are brought in. They're offered up to the Lord on the brazen altar. Um, and that is, that is where, um, before you could even get close to where the holy place was, there were some things that had to happen. You came in with thanksgiving and praise. You, you, you came in through a place of repentance and offering up a sacrifice to the Lord. And then you had the bronze laver. And the bronze laver was a copper pool uh, and, or a wash basin. And it was for ceremonial washing. But it was, had a reflective surf, surface. So you would come and you would wash up because you just came through the messy part of worship or of, of praise. Um, you were offering sacrifices. You were, you were waving your grain, what, whatever else you brought before the Lord. Um, you were doing all of that. And then before you could even get near the steps to get into the holy place, it was an act of repentance. You looked into the reflective surface, and if there was anything out of place, you got it in order. Because in the Old Testament... Um, like Ryan had said, if anything was out of order and you got in the presence of God, you were done. Not because God is mean, not because God is angry, not because God is, is terrible, but because God is holy. Yeah. Uh, and I just want just to say this with some emphasis. God is holy. And nothing impure can come into his presence. And in the Old Testament... People had, they were terrified. They had the fear of the Lord because they knew if they got too close to God with their junk, they weren't going to make it. But God doesn't do that to keep people away. In the Old Testament, God made a way. He gave them the, the model for the tabernacle so that there was a way that they could approach him because God's heart has always been that we approach him. 
And so you would, you would have the place of repentance, and then you would get into the holy place. And in the holy place was a place of worship. You would offer up incense. Um, there were was, there was some ceremonial things that happened in this place. And then one time a year, one person would get to go in past the final veil and go into the holy of holies. And they would offer up a sacrifice. And the, and the, the, the blood sacrifice, the blood would be poured over the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant. And that would atone for the sin of the nation once, once a year that would, that would take place. Well, we know that Jesus was the final sacrifice. We know that it was Jesus' blood that was poured on the mercy seat. And that once and for all, that sacrifice was made so that we can approach God. So that... Um, we, can, we can worship him, not from afar off, but we can actually come to the presence of the Lord. But God has not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. The same God of the tabernacle is the same God of today. You might say, well, but we're New Testament believers. Yes, we have the blood of Jesus. We have his work, so we no longer have to do those things. But, but the presence of God still should not be taken lightly or for granted. Mm -hmm. And so worship in scripture was a serious deal. I think we have a tendency because of the grace of God, because of the love of God, we have the tendency to take his mercy and grace a little bit for granted, to take his presence a little bit for granted. But I would also say this, because God cares for us, he has always been protecting us from him. When Moses said, show me your glory, God said, okay, I love your heart. I love that you want to see my face. He says, but if you look at me, you won't make it. So he puts his hand over Moses and he passes by and Moses gets to get close to the glory. See, God has always made a way. He sent Jesus to make a way for us. But even still, and I believe, this is just my theory, I believe that we just get a partial glimpse of his glory now because God has mercy on us. And he knows if he just showed up all in on a Sunday morning, we'd be smoked. We'd be done. But the goal is for us to get it closer. His heart is for us to come closer. Our heart, his heart is for us to make it all the way in. And yet to get all the way in, it is more than just picking your favorite song. It is more than just having the sound be good in the room. It is more than just having a good vibe so you can snap your fingers. Uh, and, it is, and it is so much more uh, than just oftentimes of what we make it. Psalm 100, again, make a joyful shout to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Verse 4, again, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and do his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endures to all generations. So really quickly, what we see in this, in the, the model, if you will, of the tabernacle is they come in with thanksgiving and praise. It starts with a heart of gratitude. It starts with praise. Some people say, well, why do we do that kind of music? And why do we do this kind of music? We really do try to be intentional in the way that we approach God. And as a core value as a church, approaching God is our number one priority. The way we approach him is important. So you say, well, why don't we just, hey, why don't we just sing a secular song to let all the new people feel more comfortable? I'm not bringing strange fire. Uh, you can look up that reference in scripture. I'm not bringing strange fire into the presence of God. Um, and that's, that might be for someone else, but we feel like God has revealed to us the way that he wants us to approach him. And it begins with thanksgiving and praise and, and with repentance, with us recognizing what's, what is in us or on us that would keep us from his presence. And then when we enter into that place, that is where true worship happens. Psalm 25, verse 14, the Lord is a friend to those who love him. Anybody, anybody recognize that? No, because I misquoted it. <laughs> the Lord is a friend to those who fear him. The better English word is revere him. 
you know, what we, what we see in Scripture is we, we, because of the love of God, because we've all been impacted and changed by it, we tend to think more about the love of God. But the, it's not the love of God that, uh, that sustains us. It is the fear of the Lord. It's the revering God and understanding he's greater than us. He's bigger than us. He is more perfect than us. And in fact, he is always right, right? And so if, if my basis is just love, my relationship is not sustainable. My relationship with him needs to be that of reverence. And therefore, because it's reverence, I'll be less likely to be stupid and do stuff that would cause me to, to be irreverent in the presence of God. Okay, I need to move on. <laughs> Some of that was in my notes. But here's the, here's the great thing about the grace of God, the love of God. He is holy, but wrapped up in his holiness is his love and his desire for you and I to be in his presence, which is why he makes a way. Jesus made a way for us to freely come. But we should not take that lightly either. We need to, we need to understand the greatness of his sacrifice, but then also we need to be careful as we are carriers of that work of what he has done for us and not take it for granted. Um, I've used the term before, greasy grace. Um, we, are, we are saved by grace through faith, but greasy grace is taking what he's done for granted and saying, oh, well, I can just live how I want. He'll forgive me anyway. Mm -hmm. I can just do what I want. The, the problem with that is, it is that is actually contradictory. Um, uh, how, In fact, Scripture says, um, if Jesus died for you once, how can he go to the cross again? Right? Yeah. Um, Second Chronicles 5.13. Okay, I better move on before it gets too heavy. Second Chronicles 5.13, uh, going back to the model of worship. Uh, so this is another example. So this is when Solomon was dedicating the temple. King David, his father, uh, uh, told God he wanted to build the temple. God wouldn't let him build it, but he amassed tons of wealth, ton, tons of materials for it, so that when Solomon became king, God allowed him to make a temple, to make the temple for him. And before the temple was built, three days before, he called the entire nation and he said, cleanse yourselves, consecrate yourselves, prepare yourselves, because we're about to have a worship service. And that brings us to 2 Chronicles 5, 13. It says, in unison, when the trumpeters and singers were to make themselves heard with one voice, praising and thanking God, and when they raised their voices accompanied by the trumpets and the cymbals and other instruments of praise, and when they praised the Lord saying, he is good, for his mercy and loving kindness endures forever, then the house of the Lord was filled with a cloud. It was not smoke machines. <laughs> so that the priest could not remain standing to minister because of the cloud, for the glory and brilliance of the Lord filled the house of God. See, there is, there is a model for the presence of God in Scripture. And, um, and the model begins with preparation, having our hearts prepared. And I think sometimes we, we try to get prepared the moment we sit in our seats on Sunday morning. Um, but the level of preparation will determine the level of presence. Well, that was good. That was That's not good. even in my notes. You should write that down. <laughs> Um, but, there, but there is a piece in here, I need to turn it over to Ryan, but there is a piece in here that, that is important to understand in this model. Um, the model in the Old and the New Testament was this. When the people of God got together, the Bible says that he inhabits the praises of his people. When they came together, they were in one place, they were in one heart, and they sang with one voice. So if you want to know why we put words on the screen, so we can sing with one voice. If you want to know why we do our best to build relationship, to come together so that, so, that when, so that when we're coming together, we're not just a bunch of strangers, it's so that we can come and we can understand what the heart is for us in approaching God, and we can come with one heart and then sing in one voice. Um, I had a little side note about being one place. I should also put one place at one time. Worship starts at 1030, by the way. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I love opening my eyes at the second song, and it's like, whoa, more people. Hey, there are more, more, more here. <laughs> but if we want to think about, we want to think about, you're going to be like, don't let Joe talk anymore. <laughs> um, but if we want to, if, but if we really, if we really want to consider what worship's about, 
Why am I worshiping? Am I doing it to sing a song or am I doing it because I want to come near to God? Because I want, to, I want to exalt him and lift him up. These are things that we really should consider. Now, granted, we're not going to be all legalistic and be like, oh, that's it. We're, not gonna, we're going to lock the door. It's not like discipleship. If you're two minutes late, we don't let you in. That's a whole other story. Uh, not like that. It's not about legalism, but really is about how we should, every single one of us should consider how we approach God. And it's not just our worship leader's, worship director's job to get ready to approach God. It's all of us. It's all of our responsibility to approach God. Yeah. Um, you know, the, our team is getting ready to go to a conference in Portland. And I know it's going to be four days of just full-on worship. And it's amazing. And the music is great. And there's going to be about 3,000 pastors just worshiping God with their whole heart. And the moment you walk in, you can feel the presence of God. And it is four days of the presence of God. Why is it like that? Well, it's because it's a conference. Because they're all pastors. Actually, it's because they're all prepared. They're all coming with the same heart. They're all singing together. They're, none of them are standing there going, I don't like this song. I'm not sure if I want to worship. That's really not my style. Mom, mm, mm. I, I heard I heard someone say this recently. Said if you if 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 you invited someone to your home to a, for dinner to a table and you had prepared a banquet for them and you invited them to your banquet table and when they got to the table and you were ready for them to 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 engage across the table and all they did was text on their phone or all they did was sit there with their arms crossed or if they just stood there. Would you want to invite them back? Would you talk to them? Listen, you, you might give them the salad, but you're not passing them the gravy. <laughs> just a thought. Go ahead. Um, just also, real quick, I want to touch on the fear of the Lord. Um, so I think we, we as the church, we love looking at the Lord as our Savior, the good, the loving, the merciful, the faithful kind. Um, but a lot of us don't really have the fear of the Lord or the reverence as, with him being Lord. So a good way to approach the Lord and have a good like 360 view of who he is is to look at the names of God. But also really internalize like, yes, he's Savior, but he has to be all of the things at once. He can't just be Savior. He has to be the Lord of your life. You have to do what he says. And then he can't just be Lord because he's not like a dictator being mean up there telling you what to do. He also has to be good. So he's a good, loving Savior who is the Lord. So I love looking at the names of God because you really get a 360 view of who he is and how we should approach him. Um, but back to this. Um, the application in our worship. So how do we apply the tabernacle and kind of the protocol to what we do on a Sunday morning? <clears throat> we start with thanksgiving and praise. Usually the first or second song is thanksgiving or praise or repentance. And then we move ourselves into like the kind of middle of a worship set where we start to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. We usually have like a repentant kind of song that we try to put into the set list. Um, which is why we do the altar call in the middle of worship. At that point, we're really putting the ball in your court, saying, like, whatever you're feeling, whatever you're thinking, you should be responding to the Lord. Um, which, by the way, the altar is always open. Um, you don't have to wait for me to say, hey, prayer team, come on up. And it, you guys can always do that. Um, I hope you aren't waiting on me um, in the middle of a worship set. But once we've done those things, we've checked off those boxes, now we just sit at his feet and we pour our oil out. That's the vertical portion of worship. So I'm going to get into this a little bit later, and I have some examples of vertical worship and kind of horizontal worship, which is the difference between praise and worship. Um, I'll get into that in a little bit. But that's the vertical portion of worship. That's when you just sit and tell him he's holy. You tell him he's worthy. You tell him he's righteous, that he's good, that you love him. That's always the goal of worship is to land in a position of that. That's the, that's the land, that's the, uh, that's how we land the plane, basically. So, so we do, like, like we said earlier, that worship is more than just music, um, but there is an expressive part of worship, not just, oh, well, I'm a Christian, therefore I worship all day long, and 
and it has nothing to do with music. We, we do see uh, biblical examples, um, Old and New Testament, about music. Um, we, we, use, we refer to either Psalmic or Davidic, which would be referring to David, who was one of my favorite worshipers and warriors in Scripture. Um, but oftentimes we'll, we'll use those terms to describe the type of worship. Now, what kind of worship do you see in the Psalms? You see, and I'm not going to take time for all of these, but you, of course, see singing. You see kneeling. Uh, you see lifting of hands. You see clapping. Yes, the Bible talks about offering, giving a clap offering to the Lord, to the Lord. Which, by the way, if you clap for your football team, why wouldn't you clap for God? Just saying. <laughs> Makes you want to think twice about clapping for your team, doesn't it? <laughs> There's dancing. <laughs> I was going to say something funny. I better move on. Dancing, shouting, instruments, spontaneous song. All of, all of these are found in Scripture. And so when we, when we do what we do uh, around, around worship, it is more than just, well, that's the modern style. That's just the contemporary thing. There's actually biblical reference for these things. And all of them are, are, are tools and forms to worship God. By the way, music was, an invented, to wor- was invented to worship God. That is the whole purpose of music. God is the one who actually designed it so that we have a way to express it. If you're talented, if you can sing, God gave that to you. If you can play an instrument, if you got some rhythm, God, God gave that to you and some practice. But God gave that, right? <laughs> God gave that to you. Um, so true God-focused, redemption-spawned, awe-inspired worship creates an environment where God wants to show up. And we worship because he deserves it. Uh, and he deserves our awe and our passion and our love for him. That's the, our motivation and the reason for his coming. Yeah. So the difference between a praise song and a worship song is this. Praise typically is songs about what God has done, what God can do, what you need him to do. It's almost like praise songs are you are praising him for the things that he can do for you or has done for you. Um, And I have some examples of songs that are more praise than worship. Now, there's also songs that are like a little bit of both, like we just did the song Gratitude. Gratitude is a very vertical song, vertical worship, until you get to the bridge where we're actually declaring and demanding, come on my soul, don't you get shy on me, lift up your song. So the bridge portion is a little bit of a blend. And there's a lot of songs that are not like 100% praise or 100% worship. But songs like Do It Again... I've seen you move, I've seen you move the mountains, I'll see you do it again. That's a praise song. Same God, oh God, my God, I need you. Oh God, my God, I need you now. It's a praise song. And there's nothing wrong with praise songs, but I think it's healthy to have a good idea of which song it is. That way you can put it in the right category when we're going into the presence with the tabernacle kind of outline. Um, Songs like, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Battle belongs. Um, When all I see is the battle, you see my victory. And songs like Surrounded, this is how I fight my battles. Those are what you would call horizontal praise songs. Um, You're more so praising what God can do or has done. Whereas worship is you're just telling him who he is. You're just blessing his name and his character. So songs like Worthy of It All, pretty self-explanatory. Um, Forever Yahweh, your name is great and greatly to be praised. Um, Worthy you were, worthy you are. Um, Songs like Nothing Else, I'm caught up in your presence, I just want to sit here at your feet. Songs like Tremble, um, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble, you silence fear. Um, Be lifted up, be lifted higher and higher. Holy Spirit, you're welcome in this place. Come fill this room and fill the atmosphere. All hail King Jesus. I love that song. That's probably one of my favorite vertical worship songs. Um, So that is how we build worship here. Um, Just kind of let you kind of peek behind the curtain. When we're building a set list for a worship on Sunday or even like a um, pursuit night, which you should all come to pursuit night, by the way. You've been been charged. but that's how we build it. We build with praise and thanksgiving, which, is, which can be about songs that 
what God has done or can do. Um, but we always land in a vertical worship time where we're not really asking him for anything. We're not really talking about the stuff around us or what's going on. Because when you finally land in the presence of God, all you can really do is just worship him for who he is. Really removing us from the equation at the end. So Yeah, so whether, whether worship is here or in your car or wherever, sometimes we're just kind of, we don't really think about how we're doing it or whatever. And, and part of today is just to kind of, just to share a little bit of our core value, how we feel about it and how we, how we approach it. Um, but then also as worshipers, one of the things that we all should endeavor to do is to learn how to worship God. I mean, we learn how to pray. Uh, we learn how to read the Bible. Um, worship is not something that just we all of a sudden know how to do. Uh, which is why, why we see so many different expressions. And in our culture, it's like, well, I choose to worship with my hands in my pocket. Well, I, I, choose, to worship, I choose to worship with my hands up. Well, that just really comes down to a lack of understanding, really, of who worship is for and why we do it. Um, and, and even to the point of which songs. Um, Jesus said true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth as, as charismaniacs or... or Whatever, however you would describe us, uh, we we just we we love to be free in worshiping God. Sometimes it's more is more spirit and truth. But truth is, is are we being true in what we're saying, which requires thinking about the words that we're singing, which which means what am I actually saying to God? Am I reading it on the screen? Am I just saying the words? Am I just being a parrot, or am I actually proclaiming what God is what what I, what is God is hearing? Because here's the thing, he's hearing what I'm saying. Do I mean what I'm saying? Um, is anybody able to have a conversation while you're texting? Talk to someone in text at the same time? Yeah, I think sometimes we do that in our worship. Um, but anyway, but let's get back to the motivation. Well, that wasn't, wasn't supposed to be so heavy. It was good, though. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, well, here, here's the heart behind all of it. I just want Jesus. I just want his presence. We put a lot of time and effort, you, all of us, we put a lot of time and effort, and we spend a lot, we invest a lot. We have a full-time worship director um, because worship is a priority, because it's important, not just because we want to have good music so more people come to church. It might be a side benefit, but there's a point where that becomes self-serving, huh? Um, and so, so today, we're just doing our best to give some explanation, but we want to model. We want to model what we're talking about. Would you take your communion emblems? And if you would just go ahead and open the one side with the wafer or cracker, whatever that is, the bread. And then you can flip over to the other side and go ahead and open it up carefully. It might be pressurized because we are at 5,000 feet. <laughs> Open up the juice. And I just want to hold on to it for just a moment. And we talked about how we approach God. Jesus taught his disciples so many things. But it was his final teaching at the, the last supper, their last Passover together. Um, he, he instructed them to do this. He says, as often as you do this, remember me. Remember what? Remember his life. Remember the times that they had. Uh, but he brought out the bread and he brought out the, the, the juice and he said, this is my body. This is broken for you. Your wholeness will be because of my brokenness. Because my body is broken, you'll have healing. Because my body is broken, you'll have unity. The body of Christ can be one because of what I'm doing, what's going to happen to my body. And he says, remember this. Remember. Part of approaching him in our time of worship needs to begin with remembering why we come. Psalm 100 says to come with gladness. Sometimes we come with our junk. Sometimes we come because we just need something. And you've heard me say this before. We need to leave our junk at the cross and bring our praise to the throne. And 
communion is a great way to do that. So just take the bread. Lord, praise you that you allowed your body to be broken so that we could be whole. So that we could be whole individually, but so the body of Christ can be whole. We can have unity. And because we have unity, we have worship. We can worship together in one place with one voice and one heart. Thank you for your broken body. Let's take the bread. And he took the cup. He said, this is the blood of a new covenant. You no longer have to bring animals into the courtyards to the brazen altar. You no longer have to go to the slaughter tables. His sacrifice did it once and for all and his blood covered the mercy seat. So now when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. When he looks at us, he doesn't see what keeps us away from him. When he looks at us through the blood of Jesus Christ, he sees his kids. Scripture says that we are hidden in Christ. We are hidden in him. What does that mean? It means the part of us that is unholy, that's not worthy enough to come into his presence, is hidden in Christ. And when you are covered by the blood of the lamb, when he looks at you, he just sees the righteousness of God. Which is how we're allowed, why we're allowed to even be in his presence today. To even experience his manifest presence without having to go to a tabernacle. So Jesus, thank you. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your sacrifice. Lord, we remind ourselves of what your blood does for us. How your blood covers us. That we have access now. That we can freely, boldly come before the throne of grace. We can come to the throne because of your cross. Thank you for your blood. Let's take the juice. Let's worship.
just take a moment right where you are just express your heart to the Lord just sing put the PS at the end of the postcard we come asking for so many things we come with our wants Lord we come with our needs but God if we have you everything else is taken care of anyway Jesus you said to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and everything else will be added Lord would you place in us a heart like David that put praise for you above everything else who refused to offer an offering that cost him nothing, who understood what the sacrifice of praise was all about, understood what obedience, even when it hurts, was all about, who understood the fear of the Lord. The Lord, you said he, had a, he was a man after your own heart. Would you make us a church after your own heart? You have already done so much for us. You owe me nothing. You owe me nothing. I just want to be with you, Jesus. We just want to be in your presence, God. We just want to honor you. We just want to give you the glory that you deserve. You are the superstar. You are the hero of our story. You are the most important one in the room. Jesus, right now, every eye is on you. Lord, help us when we come together that we're not looking at ourselves or at each other. Help us that when we sing, we're not singing to each other so it doesn't care, it doesn't matter how we sound because we're singing to an audience of one. That when we clap, when we dance, when we shout, when we raise our hands, when we fall on our faces before you it is for you and you alone bring us back to a heart of worship bring us back to a place where the things that we've made it just fall away help us to be true worshipers to worship in spirit and in truth Offer up your bodies as living sacrifices. 
holy and blameless before the Lord, holy and pleasing, for this is your reasonable act of worship. Jesus, you gave everything for us. Who are we to withhold from you? We give you our worship. Holy Spirit, help us to be worshipers, not just singers of songs. Not just Christians with a bumper sticker or people that go to church. Help us to be true worshipers. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, give God a clap and shout. He is worthy. He is so worthy. He is so worth it.